At the end of November 1941, Fritz Tott, the head of the German armaments ministry, demanded a meeting with Adolf Hitler. Todd said to Hitler the war would cost something like $150 billion, which is more than Germany's gross domestic product before the war. Put bluntly, Nazi Germany's failure to not rush her out the war in the summer of 1941 meant that she could basically no longer afford the war. As Tote said, this war can no longer be won militarily. Now just think about that for a moment. In the winter of 1941, this is even before Hitler had failed to take Moscow, years before the end of the war, Hitler has actually been told that he can't win the war. Yet Hitler chooses to fight on. Hitler does more than that, because on December the 11th, he then declares war on the United States after Pearl Harbor. Just think about that. He is declaring war on the richest nation on Earth when he's got no money to do so. It's surely total lunacy. On the face of it, it's crazy. But what you've really got to do is to try and see the world from Hitler's perspective. One of the factors clearly influencing Hitler's decision to continue to fight the war to the desperate end is his conviction that he's really fighting two wars. He's fighting a standard war between the great powers, but he was also fighting a war against the international Jewish conspiracy. This is his chance to attack what he regards as the biggest enemy, the Jewish bankers in America. Unless you see Hitler's vision of war in that way, it's quite hard to work out why he continues to fight the way he does. For Hitler, this is a war of numbers, and there's only one number that counts. It's not dollars, it's not Reichsmarks, it's the number of Jews he can kill. Right from the very beginning, Hitler's war was never just about conquest. It was about extermination. Hitler's plan was always to take over vast swathes of land and basically to get rid of its population to make room for Germans, Lebensraum. And just as he did in Poland, Hitler sends squads of merciless killers to Russia. Their sole purpose is the ethnic cleansing of Germany's Lebensraum. In preparing the Operation Barbarossa, um, four uh, Einsatzgruppen units were created. In the summer of 1941, they were expanded initially from 3,000 to maybe around 30,000 people involved in direct atrocities. And the Einsatzgruppen became the primary forces behind the mass shootings of Jews in Ukraine, in Belarus, in the Baltic states, and in southern Russia. But death squads form only part of the Nazi killing machine. It's also important to remember the cost which was built into the plan, it wasn't incidental, of allowing millions of people, millions of Russians and Ukrainians, to starve to death. The sheer callousness of Nazi strategy is thrown into full focus as the panzers of Army Group North reach Leningrad in September 1941. This is the city of the revolution, named after Lenin. The German army no longer had the strength to take both Leningrad and Moscow, so Hitler decided to starve the city. But he didn't intend to starve Leningrad into submission. He wanted to starve it to death. Hitler had absolutely no concern for the welfare of the civilians. He said, we have no interest in saving a single civilian. A cordon would be placed around the city, so not only couldn't the city be relieved, but also the citizens couldn't come out. This is a brutal process in which, at the very beginning of it, the Nazis bomb a food depot. The four-acre site is engulfed in flames, incinerating 3,000 tonnes of valuable bread-making flour, enough for six months. This begins the longest siege in history. Almost three and a half million people were trapped by the siege of Leningrad. In the end, they held out for 872 days, that's almost two and a half years, against constant bombardment by the Germans. A daily minimum of 1,000 tons of supplies is needed to keep the population of Leningrad alive. Most of these are ferried across Lake Ladoga, 
to the east of the city, along a hard-won corridor carved out of the German lines. When winter set in, that lake froze, and that meant that the Soviets were able to build a highway across the ice, so food and supplies could be brought in and people could be brought out. But the ice was not always reliable. One woman was travelling across the ice uh, as part of a convoy. She was in the second lorry. Her children were in the first lorry. And she recalls watching that lorry with her children just sink down into the ice. Her lorry didn't stop, it just simply went round the first lorry. And she watched her children going under as her lorry simply carried on. Despite the highway, supplies often fall far short of the 1,000 tons per day the city needs. By November 1941, the food ration is 125 grams of bread a day, which is you know, not enough uh, calorific intake to sustain human life. It is a fraction of the rations received in other countries, even under wartime conditions. Imagine this loaf of bread is the daily calorific intake required for somebody in the Second World War. In Britain, even with rationing, you actually get more than a loaf per person per day. In Nazi Germany, well, it starts off at a loaf per person per day, but it drops as the war goes on. But that has to be better than occupied Europe. Here, you're on half a loaf per person per day. That's just enough to stop you from starving. But even that's better than if you found yourself in Leningrad, besieged by the Nazis. That's just two slices per person per day. In 1944, in the Warsaw Ghetto, a single slice of bread. And if you were in a concentration camp, it drops to just that. And that's murder, pure and simple. Things get so bad in Leningrad that people resort to all kinds of desperate measures to stay alive. People were eating household pets and rats, anything, even if it was poisonous. They had no heating, they had no transportation, they had to go and uh, fetch water from a hole in the river Neva. Uh, the effort required even to go and do that was enormous. People were collapsing in the street, grabbing bread from the hands of strangers, and there was uh, an expression which was, quite simply, don't go to bed because very often if you lay down, you were in such a physically weak state that you simply wouldn't wake up again. But dying in your sleep could be the least of your problems. A housing administrator visited a woman whose children had died and there was a pot boiling on the stove. And the woman said, oh, that's mutton. Um, so the housing administrator took out the lid and started um, ladling through it and there was a human hand inside the pot. Over the course of the siege, something like 2,000 people were arrested for cannibalism, and that was just the tip of the iceberg. More than 1.1 million soldiers and civilians die in Leningrad at a rate of around 1,000 a day, all part of the Nazi plan to starve Russia to death. More Russian people were killed at Leningrad than British and American soldiers were killed throughout the entirety of the war. But Leningrad refuses to surrender, and the siege drags on for years. 872 days, starting in September 1941, ending in January 1944. In the end, it would have made far more sense for Hitler either to bring his troops away from Leningrad or to devote enough troops to actually take the city. Yet for Hitler, Leningrad is a symptom of a much, much darker malaise. Because by January 1942, the Nazis have decided that starvation isn't quick enough and bullets are too messy. To fulfill their racial destiny, they must turn murder into an industry. On the 20th of January 1942, 15 middle-ranking functionaries of the Nazi administration met in a lakeside country house at Vonsey on the outskirts of Berlin. It was a number of bureaucrats meeting to decide precisely how to best exterminate the Jewish people before relaxing over cognac and cigars. It is not a moment when key decisions are made. 
but actually just collating, coordinating. The Vance Conference marks that switch from mass shootings, mostly in the former Soviet territories, to mass extermination, which means the construction of dedicated killing facilities. It is quite significant in some ways. For one thing, it was actually trying to implicate people from different areas, different backgrounds, so that more people would feel some responsibility both for carrying this forwards and maintaining secrecy as best they could. By the end of the war, as many as 800,000 people had become implicated, either directly or indirectly, in what would become chillingly known as the final solution to the Jewish question. Their murderous intent was driven by Hitler's growing conviction that he must kill as many Jews as he can. This is a war which is accelerated during this period because Hitler thinks the Jews really are responsible for what's happening. He thinks that for every German killed on the Eastern Front, you know, a Jew has got to pay. Then, on the 7th of December, 1941, Hitler's war against international Jewry takes on a whole new urgency after Japan bombs Pearl Harbor. At the end of 1941, beginning of 1942, there's no doubt that the problem against the Jews becomes radicalised. Partly because the United States has entered the war. Uh, it's now a global war against the Jews and international Jewry. Uh, and that if he doesn't fight that war to the end, they will destroy Germany. And so this is where the focal point of the war for Hitler, the, 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 the fight against the Jews really came to a head. He felt that even if he was going to suffer military defeat, he would have gone a long way towards accomplishing his central war aim by exterminating the Jews. His time was limited, and he would have to find more expeditious ways to eliminate the Jewish people. Yet while the war with America may have accelerated the Holocaust, it did not start it. Some historians argue that actually it was the development of a European war into a world war with the entry of America that made all the difference. But I think all the evidence suggests that the difference had already been in the planning in the preceding months. That planning was prompted by a brutally simple logistics problem. Shooting hundreds of thousands of Jews to death costs too much time and manpower and bullets. The way in which the Nazis had murdered Jews in the former Soviet Union through shooting couldn't be repeated infinitely for the Jews of the whole of Nazi-occupied Europe. But there are other reasons, too. The shootings were not practical for a variety of reasons to do with being visible, being public, the shooters having to get blind drunk, some of the shooters having severe mental problems as a result. So they start looking for more efficient ways of killing. During the autumn of 1941, experiments on Soviet prisoners of war, as well as on Jews, were carried out, and the idea was to find the best, the quickest, the safest, means of murdering Jews. In Shulm, though, they devised specially constructed vans where the exhaust pipe was piped back in. People were told to get in the back of the truck, and in the course of that uh, journey to a mass grave, they'd asphyxiated those people with carbon monoxide fumes. So Shulm, though, was the first place where they really started bringing Jews to a specific place in order to kill them, rather than going to places where there were lots of Jews and killing them where they found them. At the same time as between 150 and 300,000 Jews and gypsies were being suffocated in vans at Chelmno, another, more efficient method of killing was being developed elsewhere. There were six sanatoria for the mentally and physically disabled within the Reich that were repurposed to kill the mentally and physically disabled. However, in August 41, there is this public sermon by Bishop Clemens Count von Galen. There is a lot of public outcry, and Hitler, ever worried about his support in the population, terminates that officially. That's at exactly the same time as reports are coming from the East saying that the shootings are not going well. And so the euthanasia experts are brought in to look at other ways of gassing 
and one of these is to experiment with Cyclone B gas, which they do on September the 3rd in Auschwitz, killing Soviet prisoners of war on that particular experiment. This proved so effective that the Nazis eventually converted the nearby POW camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau into a dedicated death camp with four gas chambers capable of killing 4,416 people a day, almost 1.6 million people a year. Additional killing facilities were created at Belzec, Sobibor, Majdanek, and Treblinka in Poland. It took no time before the death camps were functioning like clockwork. The camps were heavily camouflaged, so people would arrive thinking they were being taken to a work camp. You would be subjected to a selection process. If you were sent one way because you were uh, old or you were young or um, you were unfit to work, then you would essentially be uh, sent to have a shower. This was in fact not a shower, but a gas chamber. They would have to get undressed, leave their belongings and so on, and then they would be herded into the gas chambers. Either a Zyklon B tablet would be put into a special hatch and would gas everybody inside to death, or else carbon monoxide would be pumped in. Either way, everybody in that supposed shower would end up dead. Their bodies would then be cleared away by the Zonda Commando. These were, were inmates whose job it was to uh, take away the gold teeth, to, to take away anything else that could be used and to dispose of the body. Mostly Zonda Commando gangs worked for a little while and then they too were gassed, but a few did survive. And the way they describe what must have been a struggle within the gas chambers, how the strongest, the fittest were on top of the mound and the weak and the old and the children were at the bottom, partly trampled to death. And some of the accounts talk about the way people were more or less stuck together, sometimes embracing each other, and it was difficult to disentangle them. But Zonda Commando members were themselves victims, and so the perpetrators again had an easier job of it, not having to do that very emotive, close work with the dead bodies of those they'd just killed. Now, if you survived the entry procedure, that was because you had some work left in you. You would therefore have your head shaved, you would receive a tattoo, you would be sent to a barracks, and there your work would begin, making munitions or whatever it was that was being made inside that camp. You would live on starvation rations, uh, you would be liable to be killed at any moment. And not just killed. Women in the camps could be subjected to the most inhumane treatment. An SS sergeant, a man called Eric Bauer, recalled the fact that he had kept two sex slaves, uh, two Jewish actresses called Ruth and Gisela, and he had kept them, uh, and then other SS NCOs, officers, people had come in on a regular basis and just basically raped them. And he had complained in his testimony uh, about the fact that their being raped at night in his custody used to keep him awake. Like so many others, the girls were used like animals, then gassed once their usefulness was over. This took state-sponsored mass murder to a whole new level. There had been previous genocides, for instance, the Armenian genocide in, um, in Turkey during the First World War, and others before that throughout history. But the death camps were something unique in human history. Hitler and Himmler and the SS industrialized this process. You had the transport system, the fact that it was not so difficult through Germany's excellent railway system to move these people to death centers. This was the supreme perversion of the um, industrial age to industrialize murder, to turn it into an industrial process to make it into the everyday. Between them, these five Polish death camps murdered at least 1,474,166 human beings by the end of 1942. And each camp only needed a couple of hundred prison guards to run them. In these hellish places, even a human kindness could inadvertently snuff out life. 
Frida Weinmann was the daughter of a woman with three young children. And when they arrived at Auschwitz, Frida and her two brothers were sent one way, while Frida's mother was handed somebody else's child and sent the other way. And when Frida's older brother saw this happening, he sent his little brother over to the other queue to stand with Frida's mother because he felt that his little brother would feel safer with his own mother. But of course, what he was actually doing was condemning his brother to death because they were in the queue to be taken straight to the gas chamber. A quite different example, which I think is so little written about, is that of gay men. There was a French homosexual called Pierre Zale and he had to stand and see how his young lover called Joe, with whom he was deeply in love, was brought into the camp, was made to stand in the middle in the Appelplatz, had a bucket put over his head, and then dogs were unleashed on him and he was torn apart, alive. Pierre Zale could never get over that experience for the rest of his life. That's the kind of human tragedy that multiplied by millions was taking place every single day. By the end of the war, the Nazi death camps had killed up to 2 million, 682,508 innocent people. The extraordinary numbers killed in ghettos and by Einsatzgruppen death squads increased the total number of Jews murdered to an estimated 6 million. <laughs> So, how did a civilized 20th century society get to the point where it was mass murdering millions of people just because of who they were? We can talk about rabid anti Semitism, we can talk about Nazi ideology and seeing the Jews as the root of all evil, but all of that doesn't ultimately explain the madness of deciding you are going to physically murder all these human beings of every age from tiny babyhood through to old age. One of the most important things in relation to Holocaust is not simply to sideline it as something from history something that, that happened a long time ago to other people. The main thing is not to forget that this happened, but even more importantly, not to forget how it happened. A big part of this is depriving people of their humanity, it, even in the way we talk about other people, that it's better that they drown than uh, arrive on our shores. This is the kind of mindset that it's not a million miles from where we ended up at the end of the 1930s. You can see the initial problems being in 1933-34, when people just fall into line, whether it's careerism, opportunism, bandwagon effect. I think that capitulation by people who should have known better and should have done otherwise in the first 18 months is the first step where it really goes badly wrong. It's partly, of course, there's an endless propaganda that presents the Jew as the enemy and so on. And then you increase that with little acts by saying that these people are different. These people are not good. They're not healthy to society as a whole. And soon people are taking this for granted, that that is the way things are. Well, perhaps they deserve to be treated like this because, you know, there's no smoke without fire. And then it gets more extreme and more extreme. And by that time, you, as the bystander, are somehow implicated in this. There's an increasing radicalization. And once it's in wartime, it's a quite different situation. Because there you can say, your country is endangered, your country is at war. If you're a good patriotic German, you don't want to risk endangering your country at war. Step by step, you cross all those thresholds until it is actually possible to kill Jews in, in huge numbers without really questioning why you're doing it. Words are so important. That's where it all starts. Phrases like they're not people, they're animals. Easy enough to overlook, 
But my goodness me, do they lead places. Because before you know it, terrible things could be happening again. By discounting the Jews and Slavs as animals, Hitler and his henchmen could justify all that they had done so far. But to cling on long enough to kill all the Jews it can find, Hitler's tottering state needs more resources to fight the war. And in spring 1942, the Nazis come up with a plan to do just that. It will thrust one Russian town into the cauldron of history. Its name is Stalingrad. On the 8th of May, 1942, more than one and a half million German troops, backed up by almost 2,000 tanks and over 2,000 aircraft, roll into the northern Caucasus. They find themselves facing 1.7 million Russians, with almost 4,000 tanks and 1,600 planes. But despite their numbers, the Russians aren't ready for what hits them. Stalin was so convinced that a German attack was still coming in Moscow uh, that he refused to believe any intelligence to suggest otherwise. Hitler is absolutely elated, because now that spring's here, those panzers can really punch through, just as they did in the blitzkrieg of the early days of Barbarossa. But after their initial surprise, the Soviet fullback becomes more organized. These armies are withdrawing strategically, so uh, the forces that end up withdrawing to Stalingrad uh, have not been crushed in the way that uh, some of those forces were in June, July and August of 1941. This enables the Soviets to strengthen the city that bears their leader's name. The Battle of Stalingrad is often presented as a battle between the two dictators, and Stalin wanted to defend the city that bore his name, and Hitler wanted to capture Stalingrad because it had Stalin's name. But there was more to Stalingrad than just a name. It was also an immensely important industrial hub. Strategically, it was one of the lowest crossing places of the River Volga. <laughs> and if the Germans could hold it, they would prevent the Soviets from retaking the Caucasus. Capture Stalingrad, cut the Volga, and seize the oil. But symbolically, if Stalin loses his named city, it's as though he's conceding the fight to Hitler. Determined that his named city must not fall, Stalin issues a not one step back order to the armies dedicated to its defense. When one of its generals ignores the order and starts to withdraw across the Volga, he is summarily dismissed. Stalin was incandescent. This isn't just because it's a city with his name on it. As he tells his generals, it's got these factories. You know, it's got our main waterway. If we lose the Volga, then the war is over. Bear in mind, this is the area from which Russia gets 90% of its oil. If he can deny that oil to Russia and take it to himself, he's effectively knocked the Soviet Union out of the war. And Hitler's under no illusions about this, and he even goes on to admit, if I don't seize the Caucasus by the autumn, then there's no way that I can win this war. Stalin places an iron-willed veteran of the Russian Revolution in command. His name is Vasily Chukov. When he takes over at Stalingrad on the 13th of September, 1942, the Soviet defense force has shrunk to a mere 20,000 men and 60 tanks. And the tanks have so little fuel, they have to be towed into position. By contrast, Field Marshal Friedrich Paulus's 6th Army has something like 280,000 men. The Soviets have dug into the industrial heart of the city, anchored upon a 300-foot-high artificial hill known as the Mamaev Kurgan. This high ground dominates three giant industrial factories, the most famous of which is the Dzerzhinsky Tractor Works. These factories are vast. Think of Battersea Power Station in London or Grand Central Station in New York. These huge brick and concrete structures were built for industry, but they had another purpose now. They became a kind of fortress in the battle for Stalingrad. They were able to stand up to shelling, to bombing, to assaults. They were able to protect the people holding them against the attackers. So, yes, they may have been built to produce 
all manner of industrial goods, but my goodness me, they now served a new purpose. The terrain around these factory fortresses is a pockmarked hellhole of blown out craters and collapsed buildings, bombed to rubble by German artillery and aircraft. But Zhukov realizes that the very nature of the German assault can be turned to his advantage. Cities are hell to fight in. Once you've blown half of them apart, and defenders can um, hide themselves in rubble. The rubble was perfect cover for small units with Molotov cocktails or individual snipers. It was incredibly difficult for tanks to winkle out the um, Russian snipers hiding in every building um, and fighting from every building. Chukov's locals have got a huge advantage because they know the city. He orders them to get within grenade-throwing distance. That's just a few metres, essentially, and it means that the Germans can't counterattack with their Stuka dive bombers. Because a Stuka wouldn't risk attacking very close to German armour or German troops. And to throw the German Sixth Army into a battle against these desperate people, this was something nobody had taught in the German staff colleges, how you deal with this. Even so, just one day into his command, Chukov finds himself with his back pinned against the Volga. General Paulus launches a massive assault on the city centre, driving really hard for the Mamayev Kurgan. This hill was so important that it was to be the site of continuous fighting for 112 days. And that's despite the fact that the average life expectancy of somebody fighting over it was about 76 hours. Chukov finds himself pushed so far back, the rear wheels of his rocket launchers are actually hanging over the harbour walls so he can get the elevation he needs to fire his rockets. By the evening of September the 14th, the situation is desperate. The Russians have no choice but to throw in the only reserve division they have for Stalingrad. 10,000 members of the 13th Guards, led by General Alexander Radimtsev. The guards have just been force-marched 450 miles, so it's no wonder they're exhausted. And worse still, about a 1,000 of them don't even have any rifles. They ferry across the Volga, and they're thrown straight into the fight on the other side. The ferry across the Volga is under constant bombardment. The Germans' whole strategy was if they could take the embarkation point, they could stop reinforcements coming across the Volga to keep the city uh, fighting. Just 15 tanks are holding the jetty when the guards arrive, and they charge straight at the attacking Germans, who are only about 200 yards away. The guards manage to push their way up the hill and regain the riverfront. They suffered enormous casualties, but they managed to stop the German advance. By the end of the battle, of the 10,000 guards who arrived, about 320 are still alive. Such acts of suicidal heroism become two a penny in Stalingrad. It was an epic fight for survival, hitting two of the most vile dictators and their equally ruthless armies against each other. And the stories that come out of it are just extraordinary. You've got this story of a Marine called Mikhail Panikarko, who tries to throw a Molotov cocktail, but it explodes in his hand. It drenched him in fire, but that wasn't enough to deter him. He picked up another, he carried on charging at a tank that was approaching him, and he managed to destroy the tank. And that story is so representative um, of how Soviets wanted to remember the battle. And actually, you can see him on this huge frieze, the Volga frieze, which commemorates the battle. Then you've got the extraordinary story of a signaler called Titaev, uh, who's sent to reconnect some severed communication wires on the Mamayev Kurgan. He was later found dead, but between his teeth, on one side he had one wire, and on the other side he had the other wire. He's actually used his skull as a conductor. Do we take these stories at face value? Clearly some of them are going to raise eyebrows. The whole myth of Stalingrad and the sort of smaller stories, fictionalised or not, are all part of a, a very powerful narrative that inspires the Soviets to fight back. This is what it means to defend Mother Russia. The mythology is so compelling that Hitler himself is sucked into the saga. He becomes obsessed with taking Stalingrad. On the 9th of November, he orders Paulus to strip every German unit he can find from the Axis armies defending the flanks of Stalingrad and hurl them against the anvil of the factories in the center. That same day, when Paulus is launching this great offensive, 
Hitler stands up in front of the party faithful at a huge gathering in Munich, and he says to the crowd, I will soon be the master of Stalingrad. But Hitler has reckoned without Marshal Zhukov. What Hitler doesn't know is that this is exactly what Zhukov wants him to do. Because Stalingrad, in truth, was a trap. Hitler has become so obsessed with Stalingrad that he decides to throw everything at it. This is what Zhukov has been waiting for. A lot of Germans were moving more and more of their troops and resources into Stalingrad, unknown to them, of course, the Soviet high command, and particularly Marshal Zhukov, had looked at the situation and realized this was a potential trap. What they needed to do was to build up large forces on the flanks of the long and very extended German line. Unbeknownst to Hitler, the Soviets have been preparing for a moment like this ever since the Nazi tanks first rolled into Russia. I think it's fair to say that the German high command, uh, Hitler too, of course, really had no idea what was going to be involved in the war in the Soviet Union. They thought the Red Army was you know, a primitive army, badly led, and they seemed to have no sense really of the sheer space they were going to have to occupy. It's also got countless numbers of troops in reserve, and for every factory that Hitler manages to overrun, there are another ten like it beyond the Urals. As German panzers roll into Russia, more than 2,500 Soviet industrial plants were uprooted and carried in 1.5 million railway wagons beyond the River Volga, the Ural Mountains, and as far east as Siberia, more than 2,000 miles east of Moscow. The sheer scale of Stalin's mobilization beggars belief. He has stripped and taken apart tens of thousands of factories and moved them to the east. And these factories weren't just moved a few miles. They were moved further than the Germans ever managed to reach during Operation Barbarossa. These are distances that the Nazis can only dream about. The communists had no qualms forcibly uprooting a massive army of factory workers to operate their relocated production lines. 16 and a half million men and women were forced to leave their homes to work 18-hour days, six days a week, in appalling conditions. Here are these people uprooted from their factories around Moscow, let's say, put on chains with all the machine tools, and they're taken to these god-awful places in the middle of nowhere. These places sprung up so quickly that one new town on the Volga was known as Biezmieni, which translated means the town with no name. This industrial mobilization was dedicated to one thing, rearmament. Every factory has a quota, and if you don't make your quota, the penalties are really severe. And, of course, that's one of the ironies of the Second World War, is that the Soviet Union, you know, one of the allies against Hitler's assault on freedom and democracy, has effectively enslaved his own people in order to fight this war. By the time the Germans have fought their way through Stalingrad's abandoned tractor works, Marshal Zhukov's trap is in place. This was something that Zhukov was incredibly good at, getting a plan and methodically working towards it in order to ensure that it worked uh, out optimally. Over the preceding months, he had gradually built up a formidable force. More than a million men, almost a thousand tanks, 14,000 guns and 1,350 aircraft were ready to spring his trap. The more and more Germans get sucked into the Stalingrad battle, their long line of communications becomes weaker and weaker. And Dukov knows that at some point it's going to be possible to cut that line and to encircle Stalingrad and trap all the German forces inside. He waited very patiently, and only when Hitler stripped his flanks of the last German units to leave only Italian uh, and Romanian troops did he make his move. At 7.30 that morning, 3,500 Russian guns by the opening salvos of Operation Uranus. The attack is spearheaded by T-34 and KV-1 tanks, supported by aircraft. This is a Russian blitzkrieg. This was Zhukov playing them at their own game, this enormous encircling movement which had been characteristic of how the Germans had conquered France and, and so forth. Within five days, Soviet advance columns have completely encircled Stalingrad. Now, it's at this point when any sensible general will want to mount a tactical withdrawal, and Paulus wants permission to do so. 
Hitler orders Paulus to stand firm, assuring him that the Luftwaffe will airdrop all the supplies he needs until relief arrives. Paulus tells Hitler that he needs 750 tons of supplies a day. Air Chief Marshal Goering claims he can airlift 500 tons a day. In reality, the Luftwaffe manages less than 100 tons a day. Why Hitler is listening to Goering after the failure of the Battle of Britain is frankly anybody's guess. There's no way the Luftwaffe is going to supply the volume of airdrops needed to help out Paulus. At its lowest ebb, the Luftwaffe was dropping less than 60 tons a day. And for some inexplicable reason, they weren't just dropping food. Imagine what it's like to be one of these German troops trapped in Stalingrad. You're actually starving to death. That's your biggest enemy now. And you see a plane that's got through the cordon, and it drops a package. Do you run out into the open to pick up this package? Because there's every chance you can be picked off by a sniper. So you run out, but at the same time, a comrade who has also seen it runs out. He gets shot. You manage to get to the package, and you run back undercover, praying it's going to be food. My god, you, you need food. You just want food. And with trembling hands, fumbling hands. You open it up. And it goes through your mind. What if this isn't food? What if this is ammunition? Frankly, to hell with ammunition. You need something to eat. You rip this package open. And there inside is a load of condoms. Goering has dropped you a packet of condoms. You have no bloody use for condoms at this particular moment. Whereas a piece of bread, yeah, that would come in handy. Trapped in Stalingrad, Paulus has no option but to offer a humiliating surrender. Of around 280,000 Germans who had been thrown into that cauldron, only 91,000 survive to shuffle off to captivity the 90,000 Germans who are captured at Stalingrad, only 9,626 make it back home alive. The rest are basically worked to death in the gulags. Stalingrad is a disaster for the Nazis. Of the 51 divisions that began the campaign, 32 are lost completely, and another 16 are so shattered they will never be the same again including the reinforcements poured into the region to support the stalling campaign. 12,000 guns, 3,500 tanks, and something like 3,000 aircraft have been lost with them. People are too quick to talk about turning points yeah, in relation to war. But I think what we have here is a true turning point because Hitler said at the time, if we abandon this attack, then we abandon the whole purpose of the campaign. We can't replace what we've got there, he says. If we leave there, we can never return. In other words, he was saying, if we abandon Stalingrad, we lose the Caucasus. A and with that, I think you can say he lost the war. More than 1.1 million Russian soldiers and civilians fell in the Stalingrad campaign. But behind them stand tens of millions more. And now the Soviets have the guns, the tanks, the generals to turn the tide of the war. Before Stalingrad, there was still a chance that the Germans uh, might have won in the East. After Stalingrad, they might somehow be able to hang on and keep fighting the war, but victory was gone. No prospect of victory after Stalingrad for the Germans. They don't have the actual numbers uh, with which to win the war. Hitler's words will now come back to haunt him. And on the other side of the world, another mighty conflict is about to turn the tide in the Pacific.